Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to Swayam Prabha. In our sixth session of the course Law of Contracts, we would be discussing the topic of free consent. This is the third C which we had, which we were discussing in the previous sessions. Third C when it comes to the validity of a contract or essentials of a valid contract. The first two being capacity to contract as well as consideration to contract. Now, the topics to be covered in this session number 6 are definition of consent and free consent as given under the Indian Contract Act 1872 followed by coercion, its definition and comparison with English law followed by undue influence, its definition, the concept of presumption of undue influence as well as unconscionable bargains. Then we will be proceeding to misrepresentation, its definition, fraud, its definition, then the distinction between fraud and misrepresentation. The last topic to be covered in this session is of mistake, wherein definition, the definition of mistake as well as the two types of mistake as covered under the Indian Contract Act sections 20 to 22 would be discussed. To start with, section 10 of the Indian Contract Act declares free consent to be an essential requirement of valid contract. Before proceeding to the concept of free consent, we, we would first be discussing as to what consent is and how is it perceived under the legal provisions of Indian Contract Act. You can see on your screens, section 13 of the act defines consent as two or more persons are said to consent when they agree upon same thing in the same sense. In our previous sessions, we have discussed that whenever we say parties are acting in consent, mutual consent, they are agreeing on the same thing in the same sense, I had introduced a Latin maxim for it to you, which I am again highlighting here to refresh your memories. The concept was consensus ad idem, that is to agree upon the same thing in the same sense. Now section 14 further provides for the concept of free consent as has been used or has has been mentioned under section 10. The section 14 as such is not telling you what free consent is. Instead, it is a negative definition because it says consent is said to be free when it is not caused by firstly coercion as defined in section 15 or undue influence as defined in section 16, fraud as defined in section 17 or misrepresentation as defined in section 18 or lastly mistake subject to the provisions of section 20, sections 20, 21 and 22. Herein you can see a difference in if you have read this provision properly on your screens you can see a difference here that it says coercion as defined, undue influence as defined, fraud as defined misrepresentation as defined, but for mistake it says subject to the provisions of sections 20, 21 and 22, which means it is as such not defining what mistake is. So, mistake is to be understood in its general sense only, but it will be subject to the provisions of sections 20 to 22. Consent is said to be so caused when it would not have been given, but for the existence of such coercion, undue influence, fraud, misrepresentation or mistake. 
which means a person a party would not have consented otherwise to enter into a contract if the consent would not have obtained would not have been obtained by committing fraud misrepresentation coercion or undue influence or mistake sections 19 and 19a of the indian contract act highlight that agreement is a contract voidable at option of other party whose consent was caused by coercion fraud misrepresentation or undue influence in uh, later in this session we would be going to the provisions of section 19 and 19a of the indian contract act in detail because they are delving upon the point that if the consent is is obtained through fraud coercion misrepresentation undue influence that particular contract it will become void at the option of the party whose consent has not been freely obtained freely given i would again try to refresh your memories in one of our previous sessions we had discussed as to what do we mean by the concept of or the term voidable so when we say the contract becomes voidable at the option of uh, the party whose consent was obtained through fraud misrepresentation what exactly do we mean when we say the term when we use the term voidable so section 2 clause i of the indian contract act defines voidable and and says that uh, it basically leaves option with the party it gives two options to the party whose consent has been uh, uh, is not freely given to either continue that is uh, to uh, ec- to uh, if i may say to waive off your right to challenge that contract because your consent was not free instead you choose to continue with it it becomes a valid contract and later on you have lost your right to challenge it by saying that your consent was not freely given and exercise waiver or terminate the contract so basically first is to either continue second is to exercise waiver or terminate uh, and uh, terminate the contract first in line is the concept of coercion wherein we would see how the indian contract act defines the term coercion as well as how coercion under indian law is different from the concept of duress under english law to start with coercion as defined under the indian contract act is the committing or threatening to commit any act forbidden by the indian penal code yes although the contract act still mentions the term indian the act indian penal code but we all know that in 2023 we have got bhartiya nyay sanhita or the unlawful detaining or threatening to detain any property to the prejudice of any person whatever with the intention of causing any person to enter into an agreement so it basically says a person who wishes to obtain the consent a party who wishes to obtain consent of another party another person and wants that person to enter into a contract with him then in that case coercion means that if that person in order to obtain such consent commits or even threatens to commit any offense which is punishable act punishable offense under the indian penal code or secondly unlawfully detains that is keeps in his possession unlawfully detains or threatens to detain any property to the prejudice of any person whatever with the intention of causing any person to enter into an agreement now you will see you are seeing here that it says any person any person so what is the significance of this any person if we are talking about contract we are, we should talk about two parties one party or the other party what do we mean by any person here we would be getting to this point in uh, one of our later slides the next thing which has uh, which is mentioned in the provision section 15 of uh, the indian contract act is the explanation appended to the section it says it is immaterial whether the indian penal code is or is not in force 
in the place where the coercion is employed. Coercion is said to be exercised when consent is obtained by pressure which is exerted by as we just read in the definition stated under Indian Contract Act by committing or threatening to commit any act forbidden by Indian Penal Code or unlawfully detaining or threatening to detain any property. For your better understanding, you can see on your screen certain examples have been highlighted. So, if we go through them, consent obtained by threatening to kill, by shooting pistol, by threatening to cause hurt to a person, by threatening to set a person's house on fire. All these examples are of coercion. Now, there is this uh, very highlighted judgment, you will see this judgment as uh, is mentioned here on the screen, Chikham Ami Raju versus Chikham Seshamma. You will come across this judgment many a times, whichever textbook on law of contracts you will read, it is a very uh, important judgment of Madras High Court which came in 1918. So, in this judgment, a person threatened to commit suicide. If his wife and son refused to execute a release in favor of his brother with respect to certain properties which the wife and son claimed to be their own. Now, we just saw in the definition, it says any act forbidden by the Indian Penal Code. If a person commits or threatens to commit any act forbidden by Indian Penal Code. Here in this judgment, person was threatening to commit suicide. Now, the question arose. Does this threat to commit suicide in order to obtain consent of his wife and his son, did it amount to coercion? It was held that the threat of suicide did amount to coercion under section 15 and it was held that in this case, uh, the coercion which was exercised by the husband on his wife and father on his son to get this release executed was voidable. Now, the next part, second part of co definition of coercion highlights detention of property. So, one part was committing or threatening to commit any offence which is punishable or forbidden by law of the Indian under the Indian Penal Code. The second part highlights detention of property or threatening to detain any property. Now, what do we mean by detain? I just told you detain means you and basically unlawfully detaining means that you do not have the right of possession over that property, but you continue with the possession of that property against the interest of the person who should actually be in the possession of it. Now, let us see an example has been highlighted here. So, X pledged a piece of jewellery with Y for 30,000 rupees. So, he pledged his piece of jewellery, gave it to Y and in return, he got 30,000 rupees. Now, when X goes to redeem it, that is he goes to give back uh, to return the repay the amount which had been uh, which he had received, which he had borrowed. In that situation, the pledgy that is Y insists that an additional amount of 5000 was also owed by X to Y. That means 20, 000, this 30,000 you have to give because you had pledged your piece of jewellery with me. Now you are uh, and I had given you 30,000. So now you are if you want to get this piece of jewellery back apart from what you owe me in form of the amount which you had borrowed, you also have to give this 5,000 additional to me. At that point, at that juncture in order to get that piece of jewellery back, this person X, he paid that additional amount, but he later on sued Y in order to recover that amount. Now question arises, will he succeed? because he has already given that money and he had got his piece of jewellery back which had been pledged. Now, can he successfully recover that amount? The answer is it can be recovered. Now, let us compare it with English law. Let us compare the concept of coercion under the Indian law, under the Indian Contract Act with the concept of duress under English law. There are certain stark differences between the two concepts of coercion and duress. You can see on your screens, it is mentioned that 
the concept is uh, uh, coercion, concept of coercion is identified as duress, duress under English law. Now, let us see how can we distinguish between both these concepts, what is the difference between them. Now, it says coercion includes unlawful detention of property also, remember th uh, committing, threatening to commit an offence under IPC or det unlawfully detaining or threatening to detain any property. So, this second part of section 15 which, which uh, emphasizes upon unlawful detention of property regarding that it has been the first point of difference is regarding that, that under English law unlawful detention of property is not covered under duress. Now, coercion can also be committed by person who is not a party to the contract. Remember, let us go back to the previous screen. We highlighted this any person, any person here. So, who can commit coercion? Against whom coercion can be committed? So, that is why this any person, any person comes into picture. That means, coercion can be committed by any person and it can be committed against any person. Need not necessarily be party to the contract. That is why any person. Let us go back to the difference. So, Coercion can also be committed by person who is not party to contract and can be directed to a stranger also. Any person who is not a party to contract can commit coercion and any person who is not a party to contract against that person coercion can be committed. But is it the same in English law also? The answer is no. Because duress refers to actual or threatened violence against party to contract or his near family that is wife, parent, child, but not stranger unlike the Indian law. Now, let us move on to the definition of undue influence under the Indian Contract Act section 16. But before we go through the definition, I would just like to highlight that in later slides towards the end of the session, we will also see that what is the effect of fraud, misrepresentation, coercion and undue influence on the fate of a contract. We will come to that part also. First, let us just go through the definitions and understand the concept. So, let us see what undue influence is about. As the name itself suggests, undue, that is you, it is not correct, it is incorrect, it is unreasonable if I may say, undue means unreasonable. Subsection 1 of section 16 states, a contract is said to be induced by undue influence where firstly, the relations subsisting between the parties are such that one of the parties is in a position to dominate the will of the other and uses, is using also, is in a position to dominate the will. But apart from that, one more thing is important. That is, that person uses or you can say misuses that position to obtain an unfair advantage over the other. So, two things as I have been highlighted in bold are in regards to the position of the parties or the relation between the parties that is one is in a position to dominate the will of the other and he uses or misuses that position, that dominant position against the other person and gains an unfair advantage. Unfair advantage because that person is not un entitled to that advantage. Second subsection, what we just read in the first subsection is the general principle or the general requirement or the definition you can say of undue influence. Now, there are three subsections to undue influence as given under section 16 and all three have different connotations, they have different meaning that, that is if I may say they have different uh, importance. First is laying down the general principle, second is delving further upon or supplementing you can say the concept of when one can say that uh, a party is in a position to dominate the will of the other. So, it is explaining that and thirdly the concept of presumption of undue influence and 
unconscionable bargains has been highlighted. So, let us see what second subsection is about. In particular and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing principle. Foregoing principle we are referring to subsection 1. So, let us keep aside and we do not prejudice, we are not going against what subsection 1 says, but instead we are saying that a person is deemed to be in a position to dominate the will of the other, where he holds a real or apparent authority over the other. So, this is the first thing, real or apparent authority over the other. Real authority means the relation between the two parties is such that one is in a position to dominate the will of the other parent child that is guardian ward right teacher student all th these relations are uh, employer employee master servant these relations are such wherein one is having a real authority over the other now what do we mean by apparent authority apparent authority means as such one is not in a position of authority over the other but he shows that authority or he acts under the color of that authority right Second then is where he stands in a fiduciary relation to the other, fiduciary means trust based, doctor, patient, trustee, beneficiary, client, attorney, all these relations are coming under fiduciary relation. Now, second clause of subsection 2 to section 16 states that where he makes a contract with a person whose mental capacity is temporarily or permanently affected by reason of age, illness or mental or bodily distress. So, I know that the other party whom I am making to enter into a contract with me, that person's mental capacity is either temporarily or permanently affected due to age, illness or mental or bodily distress. Now, in one of the illustrations to section 16, you will see that it has been mentioned that a person who is uh, enfeebled uh, because of his age or because of some disease he is suffering from, he is being taken care of by a nurse, right? And that uh, by a medical attendant, and that medical attendant exercises undue influence against that person who is enfeebled due to age, due to disease. And, tra and transfers his entire property in the name of that medical attendant. So, that can be one of the examples which can be uh, covered here in the clause B. Now, comes the most important or crucial we can say subsection to section 16, which is dealing with the concept of presumption of undue influence or unconscionable bargains. Let us see what it reads. It says where a person who is in a position to dominate the will of another enters into a contract with him and the transaction appears on the face of it. That is apparent. It is reflected on the face of it. This transaction uh, appears to be unconscionable. It appears to be unreasonable. It is not a bargain which a sane, which a rational person would strike or on the evidence adduced to be unconscionable. The burden of proving that such contract was not induced by undue influence shall lie upon the person in a position to dominate the will of the other. It is an exceptional situation. In general, we say, if I am claiming that my consent has not been freely obtained, burden is on me because the Indian Evidence Act, now the in, uh, Bharatiya Sakshya Adhiniyam 2023, they highlight that in the initial burden is on the person who is going to the court to in order to claim a relief to prove that his right has been affected, his right has been infringed or something wrong has happened. So, burden is on that person only. This is an exception to it. Herein, a person is saying that the other person has exercised his dominant position and has gained an unfair advantage over me. That is, he has exercised undue influence against me. So, herein the burden instead of being, instead of being on me to prove that my consent was not freely obtained or it was affected by undue influence, the burden here is on the other person, upon the person in a position to dominate the will of the other. Burden is on that person now. 
Why? Because we are presuming undue influence. It is such a transaction. That is why the term unconscionable bargain. No conscious person, no person who is conscious of his interest, no person who is conscious of his rights will ever strike that bargain. So it is of such a nature that on the face of it or on preliminary evidence, one can, it, it's, it's reflective that a normal rational person would not have entered into such bargain. So in that situation, there is a presumption. Once the relationship of dominance is established, then in such a situation, the burden will shift upon the person who is in a dominant position to prove that he did not exercise any influence. Now, the last part of section 16 states that nothing in this subsection, that is subsection 3, shall affect the provisions of section 1 of the Indian Evidence Act 1872. Now, please if you can see on the screen the last point, section 1 of the Indian Evidence Act now has been replaced by section 114 of the Bharatiya Sakshi Adhiniyam 2023 which deals with proof of good faith in transactions where one party is in relation of active confidence. Moving on to the last part of uh, undue influence, presumption of undue influence or unconscionable bargains, there are two judgments you can see on your screen which I have highlighted. So, uh, they are Raghunath Prasad versus Sarju Prasad. Uh, 1923 judgment and Subhash Chandra Das Mushib versus Ganga Prasad Das Mushib. In Raghunath Prasad versus Sarju Prasad, their money, uh, they, they were uh, a father and son. So, they were joint owners of a very uh, big property and there was, there was some issue which came up between both of them and father had initiated criminal proceedings against the son. So, in order to defend himself, he was in need of money. The son was in need of money and he approached money lenders and money was lent to him at a very, at a high rate of interest in the sense that uh, the interest was to be compounded. First thing to be considered, the court held. So, he, uh, so that because of compound interest within a period of span of a decade, the amount had exponentially increased. So, he approached a court and said that his consent was influenced by uh, this dominant, uh, th this uh, consent was influenced by the money lenders and otherwise he would not have uh, entered into such kind of a transaction, right. So, basically his consent was not freely given. Now, the court said, first thing, even if you are asserting, even if you are alleging that uh, there is the uh, uh, it's an unconscionable bargain or undue influence should be presumed even for presuming undue influence first step or first requirement is to prove that there was the relation between the two parties was such that one was in a position to dominate the will of the other that has to be proven thereafter one comes to the comes to the point of upon whom the burden lies. The court in that case held that presumption of undue influence was not present because mere, merely lending money at high rate of interest does not satisfy that undue influence has been exercised unless the relation between the parties uh, are of such a nature because there was no evidence which was submitted by the son in this case wherein he could have proven that the, the other party who lended him money was in a position to dominate his will, dominate his uh, 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 consent. Next case mentioned here is Subhash Chandra Das Mushib versus Ganga Prasad Das Mushib. Now, in this case, a grandfather, he gifted a portion of his properties to his only grandson. So, this, this man, the grandfather here, he had two sons and from one of the sons, he has he had one son, he had one grandson. So, he was the only grandson which uh, the grandfather had. So, out of natural love and affection, he gifted a portion of his property to his only grandson. On this point, on this reason, the other son 
the son, I am not saying grandson, the other son that is, if I may say for example to explain to you, if A is the grandfather here, A is the father here, B is the first son, C is the second son, C, from C the grandfather has only one grandchild, grandson and B, B basically sued on the ground that the consent of his father was obtained through undue influence and uh, the transfer of property was uh, voidable and that it was family property and equal division of the property should be there that this grandson has no, uh, if I may say, he does not have a correct title over the property because consent was uh, not freely given. But the court said just because a grandfather is gifting a portion of his property to his only grandson, it does not mean that he, that uh, the father of that uh, grandson or uh, the grandson himself have exercised any kind of undue influence. Let us move on to the next concept of fraud. Section 17 of the Indian Contract Act explains the concept of fraud or defines the concept of fraud. It states, fraud means and includes any of the following acts committed by a party to a contract or with his connivance or by his agent with intent to deceive another party there too or his agent or to induce him to enter into the contract. Basically, fraud is committed either by a party to contract or with his connivance or it has been committed by the agent of party to the contract. But why? What for? It has been committed with an intent that is intention to fool another party or make the other party believe in the existence of something which he knows is not true the or to induce him to enter into the contract. Let us see what are the following acts which are being mentioned under section 17 this part. First is the suggestion as a fact of that which is not true by one who does not believe it to be true. That means I know what I am telling the other person is false. I know everything but still I make the other person believe that it is correct. The active concealment of a fact by one having knowledge or belief of the fact. Active concealment means you are deliberately hiding some information from the other person which you are supposed to inform him. A promise made without any intention of performing it. A promise made that A will marry B. A makes a promise to B that he would marry B and makes B have sexual intercourse with him. right? And thereafter, after having sexual intercourse, A refuses to marry B. A promise made without any intention of performing it. That means at the time of making of the promise itself, this person A never intended to fulfill that promise. That is what we mean by when we say fraud. Any other act fitted to deceive. This is an open ended thing because first three are giving us instances. The fourth part is saying it apart from these three, there can be any other act fitted to deceive means wherein intentionally one party deceives the other party. Any such act or omission as the law specially declares to be fraudulent. Now essentials of fraud, there must be a representation and it must be false. We just saw in the previous slide in the provision. Representation must relate to material fact that is a relevant fact which may affect the judgment of the other person. Representation must have been made before the conclusion of the contract with intention of inducing other party to act on it. That means that at the time when you are trying to convince the other person to enter into a contract with you at that time itself you have an intention to deceive the other person and you do not wish to uh, either perform that promise which you are making 
or you are deceiving that person because you wish to gain some advantage over him. Other party must have been induced to act upon such representation. Other party must have relied upon such inducement and must have been deceived. They, these are very important aspects which have to be kept in mind. Just because I had an intention to deceive you doesn't mean that I have committed fraud. I had an intention to deceive you and because of that you believed in me, you acted upon whatever I told you and thereby I ended up committing fraud against you. So this is very important that my, re my misrepresentation which was intentionally done is the one which led you to take this decision. Let's discuss what misrepresentation is, then we can distinguish between fraud and misrepresentation. Now misrepresentation of facts can be innocent in nature as well in contrast to fraud because we just saw in the definition of fraud that in case of fraud the misrepresentation is intentional because you are trying to deceive another person. Here in case of section 18 misrepresentation simpliciter we are saying that misrepresentation of facts can be innocent also, it can be negligent also. So that is one of the points of distinction between fraud and misrepresentation that is how the consent is received, right. So in one due to misrepresentation uh, which is which can be innocent and in the other misrepresentation of facts which is intentionally done to deceive the other person. Section 18 misrepresentation means and includes firstly the positive assertion in a manner not warranted by the information of the person making it of that which is not true though he believes it to be true. So herein we are trying to say that the person is acting in an innocent manner. He is misrepresenting facts to another person because he believes them to be true but he does not have any information which warrants that it is true. Although he trusts, he acts in good faith, he trusts that this is true. I think I should stand corrected. I won't say good faith because good faith means due care and caution uh, has been taken. But herein we are saying that the person is positively asserting something or, and because he believes it to be true, it may or may not be true. Second is any breach of duty which without an intent to deceive gains an advantage to the person committing it or any one claiming under him by misleading another to his prejudice or to the prejudice of any one claiming under him. So basically what has to be highlighted here is the breach of duty. So you have a duty, you had a duty to inform to the other person but uh, you commit, you defaulted in that duty. It may be you, you, you acted in a negligent manner. It is not intentionally done. Please remember this thing because the moment I say you had a duty, you fail to perform that duty, does not mean we are saying fraud has been committed, deliberately person did not perform the duty. Here the breach of duty which we are referring to is negligence, we are not saying that it has been deliberately done. So that is a point of distinction which you need to understand. Third is causing however innocently a party to an agreement to make a mistake as to the substance of the thing which the which is the subject of the agreement. Now if we put these three clauses to uh, section 18 in short the three types of misrepresentation as covered under section 18 are unwarranted statements, breach of duty and the third clause being inducing mistake about subject matter. Now we would see what exactly is the difference between fraud and misrepresentation. So first is no intention to deceive or gain any undue advantage in misrepresentation but in fraud we know fraud means intentional misrepresentation of facts. It can be to uh, gain adva undue advantage over another person also. Then misrepresentation merely makes the contract voidable. We will be seeing this under section 19 also. So misrepresentation merely makes the contract voidable whereas injured party can claim damages as well in fraud. Now this is a point of distinction wherein we are saying that if 
the consent has been obtained through misrepresentation then at max what can happen what can be the effect of that uh, contract which has been entered into the answer is it will be deemed to be voidable at the option of the party whose consent was obtained through misrepresentation but in case of fraud in case of fraud injured party can claim damages as well when we say injured party we mean a party whose legal right has been infringed let's see now what section 19 is about it says when consent to an agreement is caused by coercion fraud or misrepresentation the agreement is a contract voidable at the option of the party whose consent was so caused a party to a contract whose consent was caused by fraud or misrepresentation so this is a common point contract is voidable at the option of the party whose consent was caused either by coercion fraud or misrepresentation now a party to a contract whose consent was caused by fraud or misrepresentation may if he thinks fit insist that the contract shall be performed and that he shall be put in the position in which he would have been if the representations made had been true now there is one exception to it it says if such consent was caused by misrepresentation or by silence which is fraudulent within the meaning of section 17 first before we proceed further i would like to tell you what do we mean by fraudulent silence within the meaning of section 17 see one of one of the aspects of section 17 which defines fraud is that mere silence does not amount to fraud mere silence does not amount to fraud right but so basically one does a distinction between active concealment and passive concealment merely remaining silent does not in itself mean that you have committed fraud against the other person it's a passive concealment but when you say have a duty to speak and then you decide to keep quiet it's like an act of concealment because you 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 are duty bound to let the other person know but you deliberately decide not to reveal it to the other person right so it says the contract nevertheless is not voidable if the party whose consent was so caused had the means of discovering the truth with ordinary diligence yes so first it is saying if the consent was caused by misrepresentation or if it was caused by fraudulent silence within the meaning of section 17 then the contract is not voidable we just read here in the first part that if it is by fraud or misrepresentation the contract will become voidable but here in the exception we are reading that if it's misrepresentation or fraudulent silence it will not be voidable why or if is there any special situation yes there is it says if the party whose consent was so caused that is caused through misrepresentation or fraudulent silence had the means of discovering the truth with ordinary diligence but did not do anything did not make any effort could have easily found out that there was something wrong but did not make any effort then in that kind of situation one cannot say that the contract is voidable at his option now explanation appended to section 19 states that a fraud or misrepresentation which did not cause the consent to a contract of the party on whom such fraud was practiced or to whom such misrepresentation was made does not render a contract voidable now this explanation is very important remember in one of the previous sessions i have highlighted the importance of an explanation to a section so under a provision if an explanation is mentioned the basic purpose of an explanation is to give further clarity to the operative part of that section to remove any kind of ambiguity from the operative part of the section or you can say to give further clarity to it right so here it is trying to tell you that 
a fraud or misrepresentation which did not cause the consent to a contract of the party that means consider a situation where i am telling something to the other person or basically i am trying uh, to make the other person believe in the existence of something which i know is false right the other person knows has the knowledge that the information which i am giving to that person is false but still that person takes the decision of entering into contract with me then we can not say that the consent of that person has been caused by or has been obtained by fraud because let's go back to that uh, particular sli slide of fraud yes just see here it says other party must have been induced to act upon such representation and must have relied upon such inducement and must have been deceived but the moment we say that the consent of the person was not caused or was not the result of such misrepresentation either either innocent or either uh, fraudulent but still that person entered into the contract fully knowing fully well aware that facts are being misrepresented then in that situation as we can see here will not render a contract voidable right let's see what section 19 capital a has to talk about because you must be wondering that we had just uh, mentioned that if the contract if the consent in a contract uh, of a party is obtained by fraud misrepresentation undue influence coercion the fate of it is it becomes voidable but in section 19 we only saw coercion fraud and misrepresentation mentioned where is undue influence so section 19 capital a of the indian contract act specifically deals with the situation where in consent of one of the parties to the contract has been obtained by undue influence let's see what it reads it says when consent to an agreement is caused by undue influence the agreement is a contract voidable at the option of the party whose consent was so caused it's the basic thing which is common for all common for all uh, the concepts we just studied coercion fraud misrepresentation that is the it, it is a contract voidable at the option of the party whose consent was not freely given now further it says any such contract may be set aside either absolutely or if the party who was entitled to avoid it has received any benefit there under upon such terms and conditions as to the court may deem may, see, may as to the court may seem just just read it carefully it is talking about two things it says any such contract may be set aside either absolutely so uh, i i am i have approached the court saying that undue influence has been exercised uh, against me and i do not wish to continue in this contract fine so it is set aside absolutely but second part says if the party who was entitled to avoid it that is at whose option it was voidable has received any benefit there under so here in basically then in the first position we are saying that benefit has not been received by the person who is claiming that undue influence has been exercised but in second part we are saying that person who is claiming undue influence has been exercised has received benefit in that contract now in such kind of a situation despite the fact that i have received some benefit and i am still uh, claiming that undue influence has been exercised then upon such terms and conditions as it may seem just to the court the contract can be set aside let's see this one illustration which is there on your screens which is from your indian contract act only which says a a money lender advances rupees 100 to b who is an agriculturist and by undue influence induces b to execute a bond for rupees 200 with interest at 6% per month the court may set the bond aside ordering b to repay the rupees 100 with such interest as may seem just just imagine he has given 100 rupees to b he has lent 100 rupees to b 
and he is exercising undue influence. Undue influence, remember, one person is in a position to dominate the will of the other and he uses that position in order to gain unfair advantage. So, is a money lender and a borrower, uh, is the relation between the two parties such that one is in a position to dominate the will of the other? Answer is yes. So, the court may set the bond aside because undue influence has been exercised and although rupees 100 has been ad had been advanced, still A is inducing B to execute a bond for rupees 200 with interest that is double the amount which he had lent. Now, in this situation the court may set the bond aside ordering B to repay the rupees 100 which actually he had borrowed from A with such interest as may seem just as would be in uh, the interest of justice. Let us come to the last concept under free consent. So, till now we have covered coercion, we covered fraud, misrepresentation, we covered undue influence. Now, the last among the topics uh, of free consent is mistake. So, mistake are of two types. Remember in the beginning of this session only when we were reading the definition of free consent, I had highlighted a point, I, I had highlighted a specific point which was that let me take you back and I think then we will be able to better appreciate what I am trying to say. Yes. So, when we were discussing this definition of free consent, see what I had highlighted, I had said that it says coercion as defined, undue influence as defined, fraud as defined, misrepresentation as defined. But mistake is not as defined, it is subject to the provisions of 20, 21 and 22. So, what I am trying to tell you is 20, 21, 22, they are not as such defining what mistake is, but they are trying to lay down or highlight certain conditions which will be decisive of whether the contract in that situation will be void, will it be voidable or what exactly will be the situation. Let us move back. So, Mistake are of two types, mistake of law, mistake of fact. We have always heard about this thing in law that we, we keep on repeating this thing that mistake of fact is an excuse. It can be taken as a defense, but mistake of law is not an excuse. A person is supposed to know the law of the land in which he is residing. Now, section 20 of the Indian Contract Act highlights that an agreement is void where both parties are under mistake as to matter of fact. Wherein we say, I mean when we say both parties, we are trying to say that it is a bilateral mistake. Bilateral mistake. So, if it is a bilateral mistake, that is both the parties have wrongly interpreted a particular condition or both have committed a mistake as to a material aspect relating to the subject matter, then in that case what happens? Let us see, it says we are both the parties to an agreement, what is to be highlighted is both the parties are under a mistake as to a matter of fact which is essential to the agreement, the agreement is void, agreement not a contract. In the previous provisions, we were seeing that it is uh, it's voidable, voidable contract agreement which is a contract voidable at the option of uh, the party whose consent was so caused, but here it clearly says agreement is void. Why not a contract? Because one of the essential requirements for a valid contract is of consensus ad idem, but here both parties are mistaken as to a very important relevant fact related to the subject matter. There is a bilateral mistake which has been committed. Therefore, it renders the agreement void. A contract has never been formed. Why? Because there was no consensus added. The explanation to section 20 states that an erroneous opinion as to the value of the thing which forms the subject matter of the agreement is not to be deemed a mistake as to matter of fact. So, we are saying if mistake 
even if bilateral mistake because this is an explanation to section 20 only which is obvious that here when we talk about mistake we are referring to a bilateral mistake only so it says an erroneous opinion as to value of the thing which forms subject matter of the agreement is not to be deemed a mistake as to a matter of fact. Let us move on to the uh, next provision under mistake that is section 21. In the section 20 we saw if there is a bilateral mistake then what will happen. So, bilateral mistake it is the agreement is void. Now, section 21 it talks about mistake of law. A contract is not voidable. It says a contract is not voidable. That means it is neither void nor voidable. So, it is not voidable because it was caused by a mistake as to any law in force in India. That means if a point, if some uh, condition related to the law of the land in India, the two parties are mistaken, that is not considered to be uh, such a mistake which will render that uh, the, con the contract between them to be void. Need to be neither void nor voidable, but a mistake as to law not in force in India that is a foreign law, it will have the same effect as a mistake of fact that is if it is a bilateral mistake of a mistake in relation to foreign law then the agreement will become void. A and B make a contract grounded on the erroneous belief that a particular debt is barred by the Indian law of limitation, contract is not voidable nor void agreement nor void contract not voidable the last provision contract caused by mistake of one party as to matter of fact so section 20 was dealing with bilateral mistake of fact which rendered agreement void 21 dealt with mistake of indian law which says it is not it is neither void nor voidable then and uh, in case of foreign law the situation will be same as it was for mistake of fact. Then 22 is dealing with unilateral mistake of fact that is one party has uh, uh, mistook the fact whereas no, uh, the other party is clear. Then it says a contract is not voidable merely because it was caused by one of the parties to it being under a mistake as to a matter of fact that means unilateral mistake will neither render the agreement void nor cont voidable contract right. So, that is uh, the that is the main thing which we have to understand if it is mistake of fact bilateral the agreement is void, but if we are talking about as in section 22 a mistake which is unilateral that is mistake on part of only one party then it says a contract is not voidable. So, that is a point of distinction. So, ultimately we come to this conclusion that this is the reason there is uh, no inclusion of section uh, uh, no inclusion of uh, basically no inclusion of definition of mistake because mistake is understood as it is in general and is having connotations which we just studied under sections 20 to 22 dealing with mistake of fact bilateral then dealing with mistake as to Indian law, the fate of it, then dealing with mistake of uh, foreign law, the fate of it and lastly under section 22 it deals with unilateral mistake of fact. Bus, you just need to highlight one aspect, you need to understand one aspect that how important is interpretation of any provision, interpretation of any statute. In all other provisions it is very directly mentioned. The agreement is contract voidable at the option of the party or in case of section 20 you just saw agreement is void, but now here what we are seeing in section 21 and 22 is contract is not voidable, contract is not voidable. With this friends I end today's session, thank you.